Welcome to the November 17th edition of Understanding the Times. Well, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, the sons of Issachar, they understood the times and they knew what God's people ought to be doing. In the time, the era we live in right now, this whole session is designed to help God's people know how to represent the kingdom in the public square. How should we be thinking as followers of Christ when it comes to all the dynamics that's going on in our culture today? So in this series, we've been looking at uh, a series of things as it relates to the seven principles that we should live by as believers. And we'll continue that series right now. Those seven principles are number one, design. Number two, authority. Number three, responsibility. Number four, ownership. Number five, or six, with a purpose. Number four is forgiveness. And number six, purpose. And number seven, success. Today, we're going to continue looking at um, the principle of purpose. It's essential to know what your purpose is. It's essential to have a good handle on why you exist. Purpose tells us why we exist. So we need to understand and know the dynamics of what that means. God has a way of sovereignly manifesting his purpose in our lives. However, there are things we can do, how we think, how we live our lives, it can go against the grain to hinder that purpose. So God works all things out so that we can walk in that purpose. It's his will, it's his plan and his purpose that we fulfill his purpose. What does that mean? It's all about his purpose and not our purpose. My purpose that I want to do with my life must come under the auspices and the authority of God's will, God's plan, God's purpose. God is only obligated to, to bring his purposes to pass, not our own. When we understand that, um, we got to get a good handle as to how we should be thinking. In an earlier session, we talked about the five questions that relate to purpose that we all must answer. There are five major questions uh, that we all must answer as it relates to our purpose. Number one is, who am I? That's your image and identity. Number two, why am I here? That's purpose. Number three, where am I going? That's destiny. Number four, what must I do? That has to do with your calling and your gifts. And number five, and this is very essential, how will I do it? That's based upon uh, what your gifts and talents are, what your abilities are. We all are wired differently. There's certain things that you could do if no one ever paid you. There's certain things you can do at a high level if no one ever complimented you, gave you an attaboy, doing a good job there. It's ingrained in the fabric and fiber of who you are. So God has put in you the capacity to fill his purpose, to fulfill his purpose. You're wired that way. You came equipped for that from the factory, as it were. So when you understand that dynamic, you begin to see how God wants your life to pan out. Even though we go through things that go against that, he always gives us the ability to overcome whatever comes against our lives. I want to look at a passage out of um, Psalm Division 57. And I want to read this out of the Amplified Classic. I want to read verse 2. Psalm Division 57, verse 2 says, I will cry to God Most High, who performs on my behalf and rewards me. So God wants to perform, move, demonstrate his power on your behalf, but then reward you and give you credit for it. Wow. Who brings to pass, watch this, his purposes for me, and surely completes them. So what that is really saying, uh, he causes the purpose to come to pass, uh, and then whatever he starts, he finishes, he will complete them. So when we understand that dynamic, we overcome the things that can hinder us from being purposeful in our lives. You know, it's a horrible thing to wake up in the morning with no sense of purpose. That can be incredibly frustrating and even overwhelming. So there's so many people who never, ever tap into why they exist, why they are here. God never intended for any of us to live our lives uh, in the painful drudgery of meaninglessness. There are people, that's how they live their lives from day to day. There's no real sense of direction, no real sense of meaning, no thing that's thrusting them forward to the next level. So a lack of purpose can lead to a lack of joy. 
So there are people who've lost their way. They don't have any joy. The Bible says in Nehemiah 8.10 that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So if I don't have any strength, it's because I don't have any joy because the joy of the Lord brings me strength. Well, I get that joy in his presence. The Bible says also in Psalms uh, in his presence is fullness of joy. So my joy is full. My joy is complete in his presence. As I'm in his presence and I have this joy, now I'm strengthened with power and might in the inward man to complete the task and to carry out his divine will and purpose. But sadly, so many of God's people are wandering aimlessly, hopelessly through life. It is essential to know that our God has a divine plan for every one of us. I want to look at a passage out of Jeremiah chapter 12. I'm sorry, Job chapter 12. Forgive me. Job chapter 12. And I want to look at this passage. I want to look at verse uh, 10. Job chapter 12, verse 10. I'm going to stay right here in the Amplified Classic Translation. It reads as follows. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. That is a powerful, powerful statement. He's saying your life is in his hands, meaning ultimately he's in control of our lives. Even when things go bad. Things go wrong. Things go awry. It's not if they will. It's a matter of when they will because bad things will happen. It's important to know that everything that happens in your life, in my life, in our lives, uh, falls into one of four categories. Either God created it, God caused it, God spoke it into being, or God allowed it to happen. Once again, everything that happens in your life, God caused it. God spoke it into existence, God created it, or God allowed it to happen. To a large extent, the things that go wrong in our lives, uh, God allowed it to happen. Why would God allow the things to happen that are bad, that are wrong, that could be detrimental to our lives? Uh, well, God is developing character in us. And when things go wrong, we suffer. Suffering is a part of character development. Character is not a gift. Never pray and ask God to bless you with more character. Character is developed by how you handle hardship, tribulations, trials, suffering. Romans 8.18 lets us know this present suffering is working for us a more eternal and weight of glory. So God's after glory in our lives. So as we handle suffering, hardship, I'm not trying to say trials by themselves make you strong. There's a song that came out years ago that trials come only to make us strong. That's not totally true. If trials made us strong, we'd all be spiritual giants. How you deal with the trial. What does that mean? Well, the Bible says in James chapter one, when you fall into temptations, tests, and trials, count it all joy. We're back to that joy thing again. So when these things happen, I can't have a woe in me, victim mentality. Oh no, oh me, oh my. No, I've got to have a mindset that says, no, in all these things, I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. This isn't mind science. This isn't positive thinking. This is applying the power of the word of God in every aspect and every dimension of our lives. You understand that things that God allows, what the devil will mean for our destruction, God allow it because he's going to use it for our construction. So what we can often look at as something that's designed to bring us down, God wants to use it to bring us up. It becomes a launching pad to the new dimension of fulfilling God's will, God's plan, and God's purpose for our lives. We don't understand that. We can go through the doldrums of defeat, discouragement, hopelessness, haplessness, no sense of meaning. And unfortunately, many of God's people, that's where they're at. We're coming out of the pandemic that hit our, our nation and the world a couple of years ago. And there are many people who've never evolved from that. They're stuck. It kind of zapped them. Suicide rates are, have gone up. Now, people battling depression and oppression and discouragement and just their whole lives on a downward spiral. It's because uh, they never recover from the implications of COVID-19. God wants us to be the head and not the tail. God wants us to have a perspective uh, that these things are under our feet, according to Ephesians chapter 1. 
So that's how his purpose works. His purpose works in spite of the negative things that could be going on in our lives at any given time. He has a plan and that plan has a deep sense of perfection to it. Now, what does that mean? We'll look in Psalm division 138. If you'll turn there with me, Psalm division 138. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation, Psalm Division 138, out of the New Living Translation. And I want to start in verse 6. Reads as follows. For though the Lord is high, yet he respect has respect for the lowly. So the bigness, the vastness, the majestic nature of God, uh, as broad and powerful as it is, uh, he is deeply engaged with the things in your life that matter the most to you. He is looking at those minute areas of your life uh, that could be a distraction or a hindrance. Uh, he has respect to the lowly. How? Bringing them into fellowship with him. So God wants us with all of our mess, with all of our struggles, with all the things that go on in our lives that aren't in line with his will. He wants us to come to him and be in fellowship with him, meaning I'm communing with him. I'm praying before his very throne. And when I need to crawl into his lap and he holds me because I'm going through issues, situations in life that are detrimental to me. They could be harmful to me, but there's a safe place. I can always come and find help and mercy in the time of need as I fellowship with him. That's such a powerful concept. But the proud and the haughty. He knows and recognizes only at a distance. So arrogance and pride and being haughty will cause me to be distanced from God. I, I won't even be able to get where I need to be with him because that cannot dwell in his presence. I have to have a humbleness of heart. He wants, he, he wants to draw me to him, but when I'm in a certain place attitudinally, it keeps me away from him. I got to let all this stuff go. All the hurt, all the pain, all the rejection, whatever has happened in our lives, we've got to know he wants us to fellowship with him. But if we're going to be proud and haughty, he knows what's going on with us. And like this unknown information to him. So he will know us from a distance. Verse seven, though I walk in the midst of trouble. Once again, we're going to have some trouble in this here world, but you will revive me. There are things that will come in your life that will zap you spiritually, zap you emotionally, zap you mentally, where you just feel drained. You feel like you just can't go any further. According to this, when I do what this word says, he will revive me. He will bring a divine synergy, a Holy Ghost anointing that will give me what I need to overcome. He says that you will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies. God recognizes their enemies uh, coming against you. And these enemies uh, are not necessarily flesh and blood. They can be, but it's not necessarily flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this present age, uh, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly or the high places. So as we're dealing with these enemies, as it were, it's important to recognize we have spiritual weapons. These weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of these strongholds. A stronghold is something strong that wants to get a hold of you. This is where these rulers of darkness operate. They want to find a dark place in you. What does that mean? An area where you're most vulnerable, an area where you struggle the most, an area where you have a propensity to go a certain way that can have an adverse effect on your walk with God, to cause you to lose your joy, <clears throat> lose the victory, to stand afar from God because you recognize you're not right. <clears throat> well, his love and his kindness is drawing you to him. And you got to make sure we're moving all the barriers that can keep us away from him. Why? This has everything to do with our purpose being fulfilled. How do we know? Let's keep reading here. Once again, in verse seven, you will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand will save me. Right hand denotes authority, power, 
dominance, control. God is going to use that instrument of him, of his being uh, to save you, to deliver you, to release you from that which can have you bound or to miss your sense of purpose. Verse 8, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. So he's looking to perfect the things that concern you the most. And your mercy and loving kindness, O Lord, endure forever. Forsake not the works of your own hands. Now, I read that out of the Amplified Classic. I'm going to go back and read this whole passage again out of the New Living Translation. Listen to this. Out of the New Living Translation, Psalm Division 138, starting at verse 6. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. Though I'm surrounded by troubles, have you ever been in a situation where trouble was all around you? Like if it's not one thing, it's another. It's always something he used to always say. So surrounded with troubles means there's a lot of spiritual activity around you. But you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand and the power of your right hand does what? Saves me. Now let me read this verse 8 out of the New Living Translation. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. Wow. God not only has plans, it's his plans. He's not going to work out your plan. He's not going to work out what you want. See, God has a purpose, uh, and the only way you and I can tap into that purpose uh, is we come to him. We don't decide our own purpose. We discover what he's already decided. We talked about that before. So as we discover that purpose, there's a plan as to how that purpose is executed. That's what this verse is saying. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. So he has a design pattern for you and me. Along life's way, there are detours. Along life's way, there could be accidents. There could be tragic events to take us off course. But he always provides a way of escape. He never leaves you by the curb there in a wreck. He never lets your life get stuck. He's always bringing you. Our God has always been an out of into kind of a God. He brought us out out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hebrews 11 talks about the great hall of faith, hall of fame of faith. And it talks about that out of weakness, they were made strong. It doesn't mean God just eradicates every weakness and makes you strong. He uses your weakness, your struggle, your propensity to go a certain way. He uses that as a base of operation to release you into the launching pad of his purpose. So what he does, uh, he works out his plans. You don't have to make that happen. You have to just hear him, obey him, submit to him. He works out his plans for your life. And what we've been, we've been trying to make up our own plan for my life. Doing what I want. God can't bless that. God can't energize that. God can't put his hand upon that. This has to be his way. It's like this. It's your way or no way. So the Lord will work out his plans for my life. How does that work? For your faithful love. You got to know, you and I, we serve a faithful God. Lamentations lets us know great is not his faithfulness, that his mercies, his loving kindness, they are new every morning. So that means no matter what you go through at any given time, what you experience on any given day, it could be a horrible day, a day that looked awful and nothing went right. When you wake up the next morning, say, devil, it's morning. His mercies are new every morning. That's part of his plan. Why? To grant you a new batch of mercy. And sometimes people look at their failures too much. And sometimes uh, looking at that failure, you begin to magnify things that have gone wrong. Magnify the struggle. Magnify the hardship. Magnify the, su the suffering. No, we're to magnify the Lord. That's why the psalmist says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So when you magnify the problem, your God isn't as big in your heart, in your mind, before you. When you magnify your God, your problem, your struggle, your suffering is minuscule in the bigness of our God. His mercies are due, are new every morning, and his faithfulness is great. God is faithful. 
no matter what you think or do. Sometimes God is faithful in spite of us. <laughs> He's just a faithful God. When you understand that dynamic of what you're going through, his faithfulness is based on his love for us. That's why your faithful love, O oh Lord, endures forever. Love never fails. So your purpose will not fail. Why? Because he's working out his plans for your life. Because he's faithful in that. And because love never fails, you never fail. Because his love is set upon you. When you get a hold of this, this changes everything. When you get the revelation of God's love for you, that's perfected, perfect love casts out fear. So you're no longer in fear. You're no longer intimidated by your circumstance. Oh, what's going to happen tomorrow? Tomorrow will take care of itself. There are people who are suicidal because they are afraid to face the consequences of tomorrow. When you know that tomorrow is in his hands, when you know God has a plan and your life, as we just got done reading, is in the palm of his hands, uh, there's a safe place for you. There's a safe place in God for you. So the enemy can't find you. Depression can't find you. Suicide can't find you. Demons can't find you. All that spiritual activity that's looking for you, you've been hidden in God in the secret place of the Most High. There is your strength. There is your victory. There is your joy. When you understand that, you get energized with power from on high, and that joy becomes your strength. It's an amazing thing. For your faithful love, O oh Lord, endures. Not for a day or two. Not for just a season. This love endures forever. So he ends this psalm by saying, don't abandon me, for you made me. Ha! Huh. God will not abandon the work of his creation. God will not abandon the one who's in his hand. God will not abandon the one whom he created for purpose and destiny. When you understand what this is really saying, uh, no matter how you feel at any given time, you are never alone. And your God will never abandon you. Jesus said, uh, I will be with you always. I will never forsake you. So now we're in a place now where people are struggling with understanding what this means because they don't have the revelation. I pray that as we're going through this series of all these seven principles, particularly the one we're talking about right now concerning purpose, that there's a, a resounding, I don't want to put this, a revelation, a resolve in your heart that now you're beginning to understand what your purpose is all about. One of the key el elements of your purpose has to do with your passion. What is it you're passionate about? What makes you angry? What kind of things uh, will stir up a righteous indignation in you? You're called to impact that. You're called to bring righteous truth to that. You're called to bring a holy kingdom standard to that. You're called to raise up the standard for the people in that realm, in that particular issue. As you understand that, uh, you get energized from power from on high. So I want to release a blessing over you. Uh, a new sense of purpose. If you've been struggling with that, I pray this word brings deliverance. If you've been struggling with that, I pray this word brings a deep sense of revelation. I pray this word, this message, as it were, has a deep sense of bringing you into a place where you know that you know that you know who you are, what you carry, what you're about. This goes back to those five questions. Who am I? The devil will use your circumstances of life to define you. If you've lost a business, if you've gone through a hard time uh, with your finances, if you're struggling in your marriage, if you're struggling with your children, if you're struggling in your ministry, any aspect of your life, uh, the enemy will use that because when you're walking in that purpose, when you're walking in that destiny, oh my goodness, you become Satan's worst nightmare. So that whole question of who am I, that's your image. That's the first thing God gave man. It wasn't money. It wasn't a career. It wasn't a business. Go look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God created them in his image and in his likeness. The first thing God gave man was his image. You lose that, you lose everything. It starts with an image. That has to do with your identity, your sense of knowing who you are. That second question, why am I here? That tells you where you're going. Or I said, why you're here, rather. That speaks directly to your reason for being, your existence, 
purpose tells you why. When I don't know why in my own heart, the devil will answer those questions for me. When I'm not clear about why I am here, he'll put things in front of me that takes me away from my purpose. That third question, that third question is essential. Where am I going? This has to do with your destiny. You have a destiny in God. According to Ephesians chapter 1 and Romans chapter 8, you've been predestined. There's a predestination. means that it's been predetermined as to where God wants your life to go. It's already been decided. It's already been predestined. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, whom he foreknew, them he also predestined. So God foreknew everything about you. God knew you before you even knew you. God arranged for you to be here. Why? Because he predestined you. When you understand that dynamic uh, along the road of life, as you're walking on your journey, there are things that transpire that you feel that it never should have happened. Maybe it shouldn't have. God knows how to make that work for you. That's why Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is so powerful. And we know that all things work together. For the good to them who love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. Not just called, you are the called according to his purpose. So now that I understand that dynamic, I'm not going to trip out because things go wrong. God has ability of making the bad things work for me. That isn't saying that everything that happens in your life, you know, God made it happen. God wanted it to happen. It's God's will. No, what that is saying is we know all things work together, meaning God takes all the horrible, awful, debilitating things and all the amazing, wonderful, powerful, spiritual things, and they all come together and he makes it all work together for your good. So at the end of the day, you will look back and you'll see things that transpired in your life that were not good things. They were bad things, but in the long run. At the end of the day, when it all panned out, it worked out for your good. That's what Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is saying. All things work together, not by themselves. He makes them work in such a way where it benefits your life. So we're talking about, why am I here? Who am I? Where am I going? What must I do? There's something in you that's got to be done. And for most of us, more than one thing that you have to accomplish, you must do this. This has to do with your calling. And we're to make our calling and our election sure. We're told in Ephesians 4, chapter 1, to walk worthy of the vocation by which we've been called. So you have a vocation from God to walk it out. And don't try to make it secular or spiritual. It all works together. God uses it. He wants you and me in every sphere we operate in to walk worthy of that calling. So even on your job, you don't go to work just to get a paycheck. If you go to work just to get a paycheck, you are most miserable. You go to work to fulfill God's purpose to bring a kingdom persona, a kingdom platform into the public sector, your career, your job, your business. And as you do that, you are representing the king and his kingdom. And it changes the atmosphere. Your motivation for even going to work shifts because it's no longer about just a paycheck. Now, I'm not minimizing the paycheck. Thank God you get a paycheck. But if that's all it is, you'll begin to lose your drive, your capacity to do what you should be doing to maximize your employment experience. And the last one, how will I do it? What does that mean? God has put certain gifts and talents in you. For most of us, you have five signature strengths, things that you're good in the way you are wired. You came from the factory with this. Uh, five signature strengths. It could be art. It could be sports. It could be public speaking. It could be mechanical ability. It could be technology ability. Uh, all of us have about five signature strengths, things that you are good at. Uh, if no one ever paid you, you are just good at this. What is that for you? That's connected to your purpose. When you answer these five questions, these are the most five most important questions you will ever answer or ask rather. And once you get the right answer, it changes the game. And now it's essential to begin to walk in that purpose. Next time, we're going to talk about things that can hinder your purpose. What is the final analysis here? 
What kind of things can throw you off course concerning your purpose? Because purpose is everything. We'll pick up on this next time. We'll see you then.